right. Hey, good morning and welcome today. Also want to welcome everyone over in our West Auditorium. Uh, it was great being with you this morning. In case you do not know, uh, for the 9 o'clock service, uh, service, we actually have two services happening at the same time. Uh, you guys are in know, uh, know what we call the East service, and then uh, right behind you we have what's called the West service, and so uh, we have a, a group of mainly our senior saints that gather uh, for a worship style that they really enjoy, but what about the worship in here today? It's almost like, uh, wow, we've already had church, uh, so really exciting to be with you guys today. Today, uh, we are starting a three weeks, so a really short sermon series from one of the 66 books that make up what we call the Bible complete is called Titus. So we're going to look at the book of Titus today. That was the uh, book in which we read earlier. Uh, we read from Titus chapter 1. So the letter to Titus, it is known as one of the pastoral epistle letters. There are three of those. You have Titus and then also Paul would write as an epistle to uh, Timothy, First and Second Timothy. So we really have three of those in the Bible. Paul is going to uh, transcribe the letter of Titus to do a couple of things. He wants to inspire Titus, but he also wants to instruct his young friend and co-worker in the ministry who's been assigned really to be a church planter. And kind of what Titus is, he's planting this church on a Greek island. And some of you are like, wow, tough job. But I mean, really, it was not a cakewalk. And you're going to see that uh, over the next three weeks. Some of you may have felt that even when you you were reading out loud some of the verses uh, that we find in Titus 1. So the people on the island of Crete uh, is really a crazy culture in which they live, and it goes against the grain or the teachings of Jesus in so many ways. And that was only reinforced by uh, their local leaders who apparently were on some massive power trip. So the, the mission that Paul has sent Titus on, it's not all sunsets and sushi, right? Uh, it, it's a tough job that he has before him. So the book of Titus, it is the only book that was written specifically for a church planter. Uh, not sure your thoughts on church. I, I remember I didn't grow up going to church and the first time I went to church, I just think you assume they've been there forever, right? Like that church has just been there since the beginning of time. God created the heavens and earth and he threw churches all across these neighborhoods. But that's not the way it happens. There was a group of people who decided to plant a church, and, and that's really why Titus uh, was written, to help them understand, what do you do when you're starting a church? Or we could say today, what are, you, what are you doing when you're trying to revitalize a church? So planting a church or revitalizing a church. Now, there's a few things uh, in this uh, introduction that we need to know about Titus, but there's a few things that we need to know about Crete. Uh, that is the island in which Paul has placed Titus. Uh, Crete, uh, where Titus was assigned, was one of the most immoral places in the ancient world. Uh, we could really call it the sin city of the Mediterranean. It's kind of what it was. So let me give you a, a few things that you need to know. Historians say this. They stayed drunk. So it wasn't like occasionally they would drink too much and get drunk. No, no, no. They stayed in a state of drunkenness. Uh, lying was a celebrated art form. So some of you didn't know, maybe you're more artistic than you thought, right? Um, in fact, in the Greek, they would say Crete 
And Crete didn't necessarily refer to the island. It referred to lying, right? So they would say something like, hey, you creeded or stop creeding, uh, meaning stop telling so many lies. Uh, hopefully this encourages all of us as we uh, get ready for this year's political season as it gets closer and closer and hotter and hotter. If you think we have it bad, listen to this. Uh, no Nowhere in the ancient world were politicians more corrupt with public policy tilted toward the people who were already in power than in Crete. Who are you going to vote for there? Uh, so Titus chapter 1, I want to read verses 12 and 13. We're not going to stand because we're going to have you over the next three weeks remain standing as we read together each of the chapters. But if you're new to STF, two things you should know about us first and foremost. We love the Word of God. Like the Word of God is going to be on center stage. That's why anytime I stand before you, uh, there will be a section in the sermon where I'll ask you to stand. You know why? We say a lot. We talk a lot. But the most important things we say and the most important things we can talk about are the Word of God. And so we stand on the Word of God. We want it to be center stage. God's Word and the worship of God. And that's why we think it's so important that, that you don't gather just for the teaching time, but we also gather for the worship time, that we are preparing our hearts for what the Lord is going to teach us. So Titus chapter 1, you'll see it on the screens. You read it out loud. Uh, verses 12 through 13 says this, Even one of their own prophets... So Paul's quoting from a local prophet, a prophet from Crete, and the prophet said this about themselves. Cretans are always liars. They're evil brutes. They're lazy gluttons. And then he says, by the way, that testimony is true. Uh, some of you are thinking, liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Kind of feels like your family coming back from vacation. Maybe that's describing you, right? So this little book of Titus, it deserves our attention because there is going to be instruction for us on how to live for God, how to please God, even in the craziness of a culture that does not love God. So in the book of Titus, uh, we're going to learn what we should avoid, right? And that's always important. But I think even more so, we are going to learn how we can strive to imitate the things of God. And then Paul's going to make this statement. And in this statement, I hope that we never forget this. Like this is one of those statements that just always needs to be running in the background of your life. It's found in Titus 1:16. It says this. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. Therefore, they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything I mean, what a harsh statement. And by the way, that's why our friend Titus has such an enormous task before him. Uh, the question that Paul helps Titus to answer is this. And, and, and Chris and I have been praying about this as we thought, you know, we have these three weeks before our missions connect. And, and, and really, as we landed on, what if we just talked through the book of Titus? Uh, this has been our prayer. And this is what we're hoping, South Tampa Fellowship, that God also answers for us. And here's the question. How do you live out your faith? in a problematic and depraved place like Crete. Because if you can live out your faith in Crete, uh, you can live out your faith in any place. If, Paul, if Titus could live it there, then we can live it here. So how do we respond when Christianity is constantly being detested and deconstructed and demeaned? where a lot of people find it irrelevant and sometimes even dull. 
right? So Paul's going to write to Titus, and he's going to answer some of those questions. And Paul has a major concern in the book. And I think if it was a concern for them, it should probably also be a concern from us. And Paul's going to highlight it often through the book. And it's found in verse 1, the very first verse, the second side of that, or the B side of that verse. And here's what it says, that there is a truth, and that's important for us to hear, that there's a truth. And, and truth doesn't always mean that it's your truth, but there is a truth, God's truth. And that truth always leads to godliness. Uh, as we're wrapping up, just so you have a little bit of background about Crete, uh, I, I want to share with you what one commentator wrote regarding this island. Living the good life of the gospel is a challenge when we live in a culture that defines the good life in other ways than God's purposes and plans. It is particularly hard in a culture where news cannot be trusted and politicians are corrupt. Now, I want to remind you, he's writing about them, not us. Can you see how they get confused? There were a harsh, selfish, racist culture in which there is great fear because of how crime was running wild. A culture where people were reluctant to do manual work, which is therefore left to migrant workers. A culture in which people routinely overate. That was the culture of, of Crete. Sorry, I misspoke there. Wow. Of America, right? Uh, so as we get started, take out your Bibles, turn those on. Titus chapter 1. And uh, we're going to walk through not all of the verses, uh, but some of the verses found in Titus 1. Titus chapter 1 verse 1 says this. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. For the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. So let's start just with who Paul is. Paul was a follower of Christ who famously converted to Christianity on what's known as the road to Damascus. He, he had been a persecutor of believers in Jesus. Matter of fact, probably the greatest martyr of all time was a young man named Stephen. And as they martyred Stephen, that means as they killed him for his faith, they did so really in honor of Paul. Paul, like Paul, we're going to kill this one for you. That's who Paul was. And, and then he became a follower of the community in which he persecuted. So, so this guy that you would say, and maybe you have a family member, a co-worker, a teammate, a friend at school, and, and you've said this, there's not a chance, and you fill in the blank, there's not a chance that person is ever going to come to faith in Christ. Well, I promise you, if you'd lived in those days, you would have said, there's not a chance that Saul or Paul would ever come to faith in Christ. I mean, after all, he's killing people for their faith in Christ. And yet we see this amazing conversion. And many people consider Paul the most important person, obviously after Christ, right, in the history of of Christianity. But notice how he identifies himself. He says, Paul, a servant of God. Now, as we wrap up the Olympics, could you imagine if a gold medalist simply described himself as an athlete? I mean, after all, some of you still describe yourself as an athlete, right? So imagine if it was Gabby or Tori, Katie or Bobby, Sydney or Cole, or any of the ladies on the gymnastics team or the soccer team or one of the guys from the basketball team or Noah, the fastest man in the world, or whoever that Clark Kent guy in gymnastics is. Well, what if they, with a gold medal around their neck, simply said, yeah, I kind of work out every once in a while. Like, are you kidding? Kidding me? What's well, kind of what it's like for Paul to simply call himself a servant, like the understatement of the year. But here's what I want you to know about Paul. Service 
not status, was his objective. Service, not status, was his outlook. Like, Paul never felt like he was better than anyone else. Matter of fact, Paul's going to feel this way. Paul's going to feel like he's the least of the brothers and sisters. Like, Paul's going to describe himself as the greatest sinner that ever lived. Paul would go on and say the things that he wanted to do, he did not do. And those things that he, he, wanted, he did not want to do, he found himself always doing. So he simply describes himself in this way. I'm, I'm just a servant. Like, that's all that I am. And everyone, you know, wants to be great. But what is greatness? Is it defined by abilities and talents or wealth or status or maybe gold medals? Well, I think Paul takes on the same attitude of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to hold on to, but allowed himself to be born in flesh so that he could serve. Jesus would say that I did not come to be served, but to serve. And that was the attitude of Paul. Paul attributed greatness to service. But again, in the second part of that verse, we see this thought that's going to run through the book of Titus, that there is a knowledge of truth that leads to godliness. That saying or that subject is going to come up over and over again over the next three weeks of this small book this, this epistle, this letter, uh, with only 46 verses, but so much theology. You know, I think God's purpose in the gospel is to create for himself a people, a God-loving, God-like people. Well, after all, that's godliness. That's what it means that we love God. Right? Like we desire to do the things of God. That's godliness. That, that, that's the point of the gospel. That we were saved, right? And that we were saved to God. That's godliness. When God saved you, he put his spirit, what's known as the Holy Spirit, inside of you. Jesus would say this, that I'm going to leave So that one greater than me can come. And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that dwells inside of you as a follower of Christ. Like you get a prize the day you commit your life to Christ. It's not just a new life. It's not just what we call salvation. But you get the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So when God saved us, he saved us unto himself that we would become his sons and daughters, that we would live our lives for his name and for his fame. I I want us to look quickly in the book of Exodus. Uh, Many of you are familiar with this uh, this saying, right, Th- this phrase that goes out. Moses is really famous for it. Uh, if you've ever watched a movie, uh, if, if you've ever read a book, especially the Bible, uh, there is this phrase, and it's, let my people go. That's kind of what uh, Moses is known for. Let my people go. But I would tell you that even the more biblically faithful uh, uh, treatments of that story They leave off the most important part. That yes, please hear this. God wants you to be free. God wants you to let go of the old ways of your life. God wants you to let go of the slavery of sin and to live in a new land. But that's not it, right? Like it's not just about you. So this second part, I would say most important part of the statement gets left out. Let my people go, why? That they might worship me. Worship me. Like that's the call. That's the call to godliness. Is that you and I would worship God. And please hear, worship is not just singing. Worship is the way you live your life. 
And that's why Paul says, I'm a servant. Basically, what he's saying there is, hey, listen, above all the things I could tell you about me, I'm a worshiper of God. Like, first and foremost. That's how I want to be identified. I want to be identified as a worshiper. Because you were made for more. You were made to worship. Like, you were made to worship a God who loves you, who created you, who allowed his only son to die for you. You were made to live for him and to worship him. So that second statement is far more essential than even the first. What God saved us to is more important than what God saved us from. And if you hear a Christian testimony, if you've ever heard that, uh, especially I, I, being in youth ministry for so many years, 25 years as a next-gen pastor, I cannot tell you how many testimonies I have heard in my lifetime. And normally it's this, 10 minutes of all the sin that was in their life, and then about 10 seconds on, you know, and then one day I prayed a prayer, and you know, well, here I am. And then they walk off stage. And it's like, what? Like, we glorify, like, this life we used to, almost as if, I kind of wish I was still in that life. Uh, and, and yet, there is this better life. There's a better way. There's a better story. Like, God doesn't want to just give you eternal life. He wants to give you an abundant life. Like, he wants you to live this life that you were like, there's not a chance I'd ever go back. But when you hear a lot of testimonies, I'm kind of like, I'm not really sure if I want to commit to Christ or commit to the way you used to live. Like, wow, that sounds amazing. Like, I enjoy that, I think. And so as Christians, we talk a lot about what God has saved us from. And you name yourself. Like everyone has a story. And not all stories are the same, but they're similar. There, there was some uh, uh, vice that held you in slavery. There, there was something that held you captive. And you can name your sin. But we often fail to talk much about what God has saved us to. That God has saved us to a better life a better purpose, a better story. So, so the point was not saving us from something, but saving us to something. So Paul says that the true gospel, that if you've truly experienced a new life in Christ, then it creates godliness in your heart, according to verse 1. That is to say, it creates like this love for God. Have you ever been around someone who just gave their life to Christ? Like, that, I mean, that's all they can talk about. It, it, it's all they want to share with you. And it's almost, isn't this bad as, as fellow believers? We're almost like, we get it. Like, we did that one time ourselves, right? Like, we're over it. It's like, do you, how do you get over that, though? Like, how do we get over that not just that we were lost, we were dead in sin. Like, we couldn't get our way out. We couldn't breathe in sin. And then God breathed into us a new life. And yet, for some reason today, much like those in Crete, we get over it. And we almost go, I kind of want to go back to the, what I guess the Bible calls the dead life, which really seems like the good life. And in Crete, that's what had happened, right? Uh, Paul's going to share a, a, a few things, and, and it really brings up this big question for us to answer. Is our faith, is our life in Christ producing godliness? That is to say, is our faith causing us to want to find more of God, to, to follow God even more than we already are, to fall more in love with God than we ever have been. That's why we say all the time, we want to help people find and follow Jesus because that is the truth that leads to godliness. It is a relationship. A relationship does that. Now, by the way, religion does not. Like, religion's never going to produce that. And you can try as hard as you want to try, but religion is not the real thing. It's not authentic. And Paul's going to address that, so let's look at it. Uh, 
It's Titus 1, 10 and 11, verse 14, verse 16. Sorry for skipping around. We're going to pick up a few of those later. For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group, meaning this, especially the religious people. They must be silenced because they are ruining a whole household by teaching things that ought not to be taught, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Then verse 13 says, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in their faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or the commands of those who reject the truth. By the way, that's what religion does. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient. They're unfit for doing anything good. I just wish when Paul wrote, he would tell us how he feels, right? Like, yeah. like he just kind of, you know, always like, where are you, Paul? Like, no one knows where you stand on certain... So in those verses, what is Paul doing? He's stressing again and again that religion cannot produce a faith that leads to godliness. That only a life in Christ can do that. You know, religion emphasizes uh, this adherence to rules rather than an internal transformation that the Holy Spirit does. A couple of things he said, verse 10, it's just mere words. In verse 13, he said, it's faithfulness, but it's faithfulness to rituals. It's faithfulness to commands. See, here's the thing. Religion wants to use God. We're a relationship with God is falling more in love with Jesus. R religion uses God, according to verse 11, for the sake of dishonest gain. In religion, here's the thing. God is a means to an end. God's just the means to maybe more prosperity, maybe a promotion, maybe a passing grade. How many of us pray? Dear God, if you could just help me pass this exam. I'll go anywhere in the world, be a missionary. And, and then you get the result back. As long as it's, you know, like maybe a place like Creed, a private island. Like, I'll go there. We change that. See, God's just the means. Religion, in fact, leads to the opposite of godliness. Instead of service, instead of gratefulness, religion produces one of two things. There, there, there's two sides of the coin of religion. One is pride. That's probably what you hear more of. Most of the religious people in the Bible, they were very prideful. But the other side of that coin is this. It's despair. Religion takes you to a place where you go, I can't do this. Like, I can't live up to this. So those who excel at religion say, look at all that I've accomplished. By the way, look at how much better I am than you. Uh, and if you were to ask... Why are you going to heaven? They would say, well, I, I, can you not see? Like, look at all of these good works. Look at all of my good deeds. Look at how good I am. Of course, if God's good and heaven's good, I'm good, I'm going to heaven. But that's religion. Because a relationship in Jesus says this, that there's no good thing inside of me. That, that my heart is wicked. That the only way I can be right with God is because of the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. Like, that's it. That's a relationship. See, if we fail to live up the standards in religion, then here's what happens. You're going to fall into pride's evil twin brother, and it's that of despair. Oh, I'm just so terrible at this. I might as well just give up, go enjoy a sinful lifestyle. At least this makes you feel better. Right, so, so there's two sides of that. And then instead of producing godliness, both pride and despair, you know what they do? They actually produce more sin in us. So instead of full surrender, religion calls for like this partial commitment. And instead of hating sin, religion says just negotiate with it. And your concern with sin is to basically just avoid God's punishment. So you ask, how close can I get and still be okay? That's the question of religion. 
Religion keeps you busy with its rituals and rules and commands, but religion never curbs sin. In fact, you know what religion does? It almost encourages it. But what about the gospel? You know what the gospel says? Not you should not, and I know many of you who grew up in church, that's all you ever heard. Thou shalt not, right? By the way, there were 10 of those, and all 10 of those was for your protection and for your provision. Matter of fact, let's just talk about one of them. Thou shalt not murder. Ooh, mean God up in heaven doesn't allow us to kill people. No, like that's for our benefit, right? To get along with people. So it's not you should not, but you need not. See, here's the cool thing about a relationship with God. You need not to get drunk because Jesus offers a better refuge than alcohol. You need not to lose your temper because God is in control of the situation. You need not to give yourself to the pursuit of money and riches because God is a better treasure. See, here's the thing. People who love God, they hate sin. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't sin, because you're always going to fight your flesh. But they're not concerned about how close they can get to it, because they hate it so badly, they want to stay away from it. And that's how people who love God feel about sin, because they know what it does to God. They know what it does to His glory. They know what it looks like for his son to be crucified on a cross. They know what it does to them. John Bunyan is usually attributed with this following statement. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly, but then gives us wings. I'll take relationship with Jesus over religion any day. So in verse 16, notice what Paul says as we begin to wrap up. Paul says, many religious people claim to know God, but by their actions of the heart, they deny him. See, here's the thing. The gospel isn't good advice. The gospel is good news. Like you don't have to do this on your own. Like God loves you and desires for you to give your life to Christ so that you can live this life in his power. It's not what I do or what I learn or what I experience that brings this new life. But it's beholding his glory. It's realizing what he's done for me. So considering that, right, Paul is going to urge us. I'm going to urge you, put your faith and trust in Christ. Don't put it in you. Because I'm telling you, as good as you may be, and some of you are really good, you're not good enough. None of us are. The Bible would say this, that no one is good. And I love this part. No, not one. Because there's always the one person in class that doesn't think the teacher's talking about them, right? Right? Like, obviously, everybody else. That doesn't mean me. No, there is none good. No, not even one. Meaning, no, not even you, right? So put your faith, trust in a personal relationship with Jesus, not a man-made religion. But here's the question. What happens when people believe the wrong story? What happens when people are religious, because we all are in some ways, right? If you've met a person and they say, oh, I'm not religion, (laughs) maybe not spiritually, but you are religious. Here's how I'm going to tell you that. I bet most of you, every morning you brush your teeth. By the way, that's religious, right? Like you're religious about that. I bet most of you eat three, four, five meals a day, right? Like you're religious about that. There's certain things, yes, you are religious. Maybe you're not religious about spiritual things, but that's why I think so many of us have heard or we've read the wrong story, that religion is the story, or, or there are other stories, or you are your own story, right? So what happens when you believe the wrong story? What happens when you believe the wrong story about your spouse? What happens when you believe the wrong story about other people? What happens when the culture around us What happens when South Tampa believes the wrong story? 
And that's why Paul would write in Titus 1 verse 5, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished. Hey, church family, as we get ready to go back to school, and some already have, can I just tell you that there are some things that are not in order. And we can't be mad at the world for being worldly. You can't be mad at sinners for sinning. And that's why Paul says, I've put you in Crete so that you can make right what has been made wrong. You, you know what Paul's assuming there? Is that Titus can lead this local group of believers to become a local church on this island. And that this local church on this island can then therefore influence that island for good and godliness. It's basically our version of reach, raise, and release. And, and how in the world did Paul think that was going to happen? By the influence of Titus. By the influence of even one person telling a better story than those in Crete had ever heard before. You know what I, I think God is saying to many of us? That the Spirit of God that dwells in you, the passion and the love you have for Jesus is the story that South Tampa needs to hear. Like they need to see a better story. They need to read a better story. And God wants to work in you, and God wants to work through you to bring Him glory, right? Hey, again, as we close, I want to remind you, it's not going to be hard to forget, but again, verse 12 and 13, here's how they were known. Here was their story. that Their prophet said they were liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. You know what Paul's doing? He's just telling their story, right? The, the, it was the story of the island. It, it was the story the entire Greek world knew, knew. It was the story that that Titus would call to be ministry to. It's, it's the story. But let me ask a question. What's the story of South Tampa? What's our story? Is it the story that it's a small town feel in a big city? Is it that we have great local coffee shops, food, and places to purchase things? Is it the story of a massive pirate invasion and parade we call Gasparilla? Like, is that our story? You know, there's probably a few ways that we could tell the story of South Tampa. Maybe it's something like this. We're a community that is smooth on the outside, but shattered on the inside. We're a community that has everything, but is still longing for more. We're a community that has every reason to be satisfied, and yet so many in South Tampa are not. I'm not sure how you would tell the story of South Tampa, but if you are a believer in Jesus, I think this would have to be a part of that story. Much of South Tampa is unsatisfied. Because much of South Tampa doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. So guess what, Titus? We're going to drop you in the middle of South Tampa so that you can live and write and tell a better story. That there's something greater than all these things that people are running so hard to chase after. That there's a God who's chasing after you. Chasing after you, not because he's mad at you. Chasing after you because he loves you. Uh, over the past 10 days, Sharon, Zeke, and I had the privilege of going to visit two of our seven church partners. By the way, why do we have church partners? I don't know. Have you read the book of Titus? Uh, like, that's what the New Testament is about. Like, once you get outside the four Gospels, it's all about we're on the same team. Like, if you're a follower of Jesus, then we wear the same jersey. It doesn't matter what's on the back of your jersey. It's what's on the front. And there is this big C church that we are a part of. So we right now have seven, almost right on the verge of, of introducing to you an eighth 
church partnership that you're going to be very excited about. But right now, seven, and Sharon and I uh, spent the last 10 days with two of them. L let me tell you about the Tabers. Uh, the Tabers have been with us many times. Matter of fact, we were the first ones to partner with them. We were the first ones to really believe in the vision that, that Jim and Brandy had that Billings, Montana could have a different story. Because if you were in Billings with me, here's the story of Billings. That there are more alcoholics in Billings than any other city. That more people have gambled away their fortune than in any other city. You know what also about the city of Billings? That there's more suicides in Billings than anyone else, anywhere else. You know what's super sad about that? The majority of those suicides, 18 and under. That's the story. And Jim and Brandy said, not on our watch, not on our island, not in Billings any longer. So, so they planted a church over five years ago in, in the city of Billings. They're every Sunday running over 300 people. Now they're in two services. And next Sunday, they're going to break ground on their first building ever. They're going to have it on this amazing street that God has provided for them. There's a park and a middle school across the street. And, and, and about two blocks down, there's a high school. And they have such a vision for changing the story of Billings. I, I said there's a park across the street T two times a year. Uh, they're able to go outside and have church in the park. Uh, they always make sure that they have worship. They always make sure they have some baptisms. Because people ask, like, why did that person get wet? Like, what's going on? And so it's a great testimony to share. Oh, that's someone who was dead. Now they're alive. And people are like, what do you mean by that? Uh, and so they're able to share the good news of the gospel. As they were doing that just a couple of uh, weeks ago, after the message, they gave an, an invitation. Many people came forward. They had a thousand people in the park at this church service. And one lady came forward and gave her life to Christ. And, and they said, well, look, we're, we're having some baptism. Would you like to be baptized? She didn't know what baptism was, but she was like, yes, if that means I'm telling people I love God, that's what I want to do. And, and so she went, she changed clothes, and she came out. They went, uh-oh, there's a problem. And they go, what's the problem? Like anyone can be baptized if you've given your life to Christ. They go, yeah, but um, she's got an ankle monitor on, so we're really not sure what we're going to do here. And they said, no problem. And so one, they have two gyms that, that are the pastors there. So one gym baptized her. The other gym held her ankle out of the water. It's the greatest thing you've ever seen. You know what they're doing? They're changing the story of Billy. And then after a few days with them, we got to go down and see our friend Trevor. Trevor was with us just several months ago. They haven't had a church service yet. And, and, and as of Saturday, they've baptized 115 people. I've got to tell I've never heard anything like this. I got the privilege of meeting several of them. Matter of fact, on Saturday, uh, they were out at this river and they baptized 20 people in the river on Saturday. Now, here's why that's so important. Do you realize that less than, less than 2% of Denver's population claims to have a faith relationship with God? You know what Trevor's doing? Like, I don't believe the story. <laughs> like, I don't care. We're going to write a different story. I I'd love to tell you about all the people I met. Hey, I gave my life three uh, months ago, and I've already led three of, uh, three of my family members to Christ. Hey, six months ago, I gave my life to Christ. I've already led six of my friends into And that's all the stories that you hear. We had the privilege of meeting an uh, a, a overseas professional basketball player who, after playing professionally overseas, uh, opened up several uh, bars in the Miami community and lived the lifestyle. He got married, and uh, his wife had faith in Christ, but she was definitely not living for the Lord at the time. And then after they got married, um, she felt very convicted because, remember, if you truly are a believer, there's a thing called the Holy Spirit that lives in you. And the Holy Spirit started doing what it does for many of us, going, uh-uh, uh-uh. That's kind of how I like to describe the Holy Spirit. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Like, that's not leading to godliness. Don't do that. And she goes, I kept hearing this, uh-uh, uh-uh. And she goes, I, I, it'd been so long, I'd, I'd become deaf to it. 
And she said, all of a sudden, she realized, like, I'm not being who I was called to be. And so even though her husband owned several bars in Miami and doing the thing, she decided she was start, going to start doing the right thing. And it's been 10 years. And about five months ago, he gave his life to Christ. And, and here's what he said. What must I do now? Kind of like the Ethiopian eunuch, right? What can I do now? He goes, um, you can be baptized. He goes, I want to be baptized. And his wife was so excited. But the minute, it was almost, I mean, he's telling the story. I'm just relaying it back to you. It was almost the exact moment he said, I want to give my life to Christ. And I want to be baptized. His wife, who, who's just amazing, all of a sudden became crippled with this chronic disease. To the point that he said, well, well, then maybe I should deny the faith. Because things were better when I wasn't a believer. Like she was healthy and happy. And she said, no, please don't do that. It got so bad, he actually called his uh, uh, in-laws and said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk. I, I think somehow, some way, I've brought this on, this, this spiritual warfare in which she's going through. And they said, listen. If the Lord chooses to slay her, you do not turn back on following Christ. So two weeks later, our friend Trevor had the privilege of baptizing him. And man, I, I wish you could have been with us as he's just glowing, sharing his God story. And immediately, her health was restored. Can I just tell you that in Denver, they're starting to tell a different story. But church, we don't live in Billings. We don't live in Denver. We live in South Tampa. What could it take for South Tampa to hear that there's a better story? What could it take for you and I to live as if we know the better story? That's what Paul's going to encourage us to do. That's what I'm going to encourage you to do, to live and tell a better story, that it's a relationship in Jesus and nothing else. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving your life for us. And God, in so doing, Lord, there's no way we can earn your love. There's no way we can pay back your love. But Lord, almost like a PS to a letter. God, we want to live and tell the story of your grace, of your mercy, of your love. God, if there's someone here today, they've never experienced a true relationship with you. Maybe their whole life, they've been religious, but God, they've never had that joy. They've never had the sweetness of knowing you. That Lord, even this morning, no one looking, no one going to cause anyone to do something they don't want to. But if you're here today, Maybe you'd say, Pastor J.D., I'm a religious person. Matter of fact, I, I'm here every Sunday. I, I read my Bible, I pray, but Pastor J.D., if I can be honest and truthful, I'm prideful. Pastor J.D., if I can be honest and truthful, I just live in despair. It's just religion. But I want a relationship. I want something that's real, something that's authentic, something with purpose and meaning. Can I tell you that's found in a relationship with Christ? And if you would so desire that, I'm going to guide you in a prayer. You're not praying to me. You're not, there's not a special prayer in the Bible. The Bible just says this, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. So I'm going to help you confess with your mouth. If it's your desire, would you pray something like this? Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for not just saying that, but showing me that. Sending your son to die for me. Father, I confess my sins to you. Lord, I haven't been obedient. God, I haven't loved you. God, I haven't followed you. Lord, I've been very prideful. And let, God, I confess that to you. Calling on your son Jesus to forgive me and save me. God, I pray the Holy Spirit would be given to me and to live inside of me in such a way that others could see my love for you. God, help me to live a better story, to tell a better story, the story that I was dead, but now I'm alive. 
Hey, if that was you this morning, no one's going to embarrass you. not going to ask you to do anything except this. Would you tell someone about that? Like if you're really in love with Jesus and meant that today, you got to tell someone. And not just someone here, because if you can't tell someone here, I promise, there's no way you're going to tell someone out there. Would you tell someone? There's some people here today would love to hear your God story. Would love to hear that today you committed yourself to Christ. Hey, for those of you who've already done that, who knows that? Like who knows about your love for the Lord? Who have you shared that story with? And this could be our opportunity. As Paul placed Titus in Crete, I believe the Lord has placed you in South Tampa to write, to tell, and to live a better story.